thank you for joining Assisting Hands Home Care for our webinar about fall prevention. Our webinars are designed to provide caregivers with information they can use to keep themselves and their loved ones happy and at home. Falls account for broken bones, head injuries, and in worst case, death. The basic rule is the older a person is, the more risk, expense, and recovery are involved with a fall. One in four adults, so that's 28% of those age 65 and older report falling in the United States. So that's about 36 million falls each year. It's an issue we see all too frequently, especially in senior care. Today we have Stephen Holy, RNBC. He's the Director of Nursing at Assisting Hands Home Care, and he will be discussing the clinical complications and implications of falls. Stephen's work in nursing includes managing dementia unit, medical surgical nursing, home care nursing, and assisted living nursing. Then we'll hear from Ed McCarthy and Claire Davids. They're co-owners of Caring Transitions of Monmouth, a senior transition and relocation specialist who will discuss improvements that can be made to a home to improve the safety, such as decluttering, identifying areas for better flow, and increasing space for necessary medical equipment. And then we'll hear from Lynn Knight, a physical therapist and author of Don't Fall, which is a guide to fall prevention. And she will discuss aging issues related to falls and simple things seniors can do to prevent in-home falls. And if you have any questions, please ask them in the chat box or raise your hand. And I am going to unmute Steven and hand off to him. Okay, Stephen, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me here today. Uh, as uh, Vicki said, I'm Stephen, Stephen Holly. Um, I've been, I'm the director of nursing here at uh, Assisting Hands, and uh, I'm very happy to be here today. Um, in my career, I've worked in the hospital setting, assisted living and home care, as she said. And in these settings and many others, the same issue surfaces again and again, which is falls. Falls are a great concern for adults, but particularly the elderly. In New Jersey in 2018, more than 2,500 older adults died due to falls. Falls are the leading cause of injury-related death among adults age 65 and older, and the fall death rate is increasing. According to the CDC, 21% of New Jersey's elderly have fallen in the past year. In the US, death rates from falls among adults age 65 and older increased about 30% from the year 29 to 2018. The fastest growing rate was among adults aged 85 and older at about 4% per year. In our country, over 800,000 people a year are hospitalized because of a fall injury, most often because of a head injury or a hip fracture. There are many causes of people falling and most of them are preventable. Certain medical conditions can predispose people to falling. Persons with visual concerns, such as macular degeneration, glaucoma, and cataracts, are more prone to falling. We need to make sure their environment is safe for them. Those who have dementia are also at risk for falls because they may not have the judgment to recognize a dangerous situation. People who take certain medications for food, uh, for, excuse me, people who take certain medications for blood pressure can get lightheaded when standing up, therefore they must rise slowly. Use of medicines such as painkillers, tranquilizers, sedatives, or antidepressants increase the risk of falling. Even some over-the-counter medicines can affect balance and how steady you are on your feet. Incontinence creates a risk for falling as well. When somebody rushes to get to the bathroom, this can happen if they take water pills. They often do not drink to prevent having to go, and then they become dehydrated, which can also lead to falls. Environmental factors such as clutter, throw rugs, and poor lighting are often the causes of falls. Also, improper use of assistance devices can lead to falls. I had a client who uses a walker. One day when she went to take the trash out, she chose to use a cane, which caused her to fall. The cane has since been, since been removed from her home. Head injuries from falls can be very serious, especially if the person is taking certain medications like blood thinners. An older person who falls and hits her head should see her doctor right away, even if she initially feels okay, to make sure she doesn't have a brain injury. 
In falls that result in fractures, the most common injuries are to the hip, ankle, arm, and wrist, with the hip fractures potentially being the most devastating. The chances of breaking your hip go up as you get older. Each year, over 300,000 older people are hospitalized for hip fractures. More than 95% of hip fractures are caused by falling, usually falling sideways. Women tend to experience three quarters of all hip fractures and fall more often than men. They are also more likely to have the osteoporosis, a disease which weakens bones and makes them more likely to break. Hip fractures usually require surgery and potentially long stays in rehab after the hospital admission. This in, turns to lead, this in turn leads to long sedentary periods in bed and chairs. The person often loses the ability to get around like they used to, with hard work and therapy being required to get them back to the previous level of mobility, if they ever do. Surgery has its own risks for the elderly. Due to their stays in the hospital rehab, they sometimes get hospital-induced delirium. The condition is a temporary form of cognitive impairment that can last anywhere between a few days and a few weeks. There are a number of causes for this. One cause is due to reaction to anesthesia. It takes much longer for older persons to clear anesthetics from their system. The longer the medications stay in their system, the more disadvantageous it is for that person and the greater the risk of changes in their mental status. Being unable to shake the effects of anesthesia can cause drastic and scary changes in the mental status and cause them to become disoriented and confused. Another cause for hospital-induced delirium is the abrupt change in environment. At home, things are slow and predictable. They have a regular bedtime and wake up at regular hours. In the hospital, there are many changes and they are in a room where lights are on in the hall at all hours, causing dis disorientation to time of day. They have people coming in the rooms very early to draw blood and take vital signs. Persons in their 80s and up will often not have surgery due to the risk from anesthesia. It may take months to heal if they ever do. They are kept in a bed where they are often immobile. This immobility can lead to issues like ulcers forming unless they are repositioned every two hours. This repositioning is often painful, causing some caregivers not to reposition the patient often enough to prevent those wounds. Some people never leave the bed due to their decreased mobility. Falls are often difficult on family, both physically and financially. When a family must care for a person with a fractured hip, they may have to take time away from work. The elderly family member might have to move in with the family for help with their care. In 2018, in New Jersey, falls cost $1.3 billion with $219 million being out of pocket. That figure is only for hospital and rehab. It does not include the cost of home care, lost wages of caregivers, and many other costs incurred when a person falls and is injured. According to the American Journal of Preventative Medicine, Implementing a single intervention could prevent as many as 45,000 medically treated falls and avert up to 442 million in direct medical costs. Ed and Claire will discuss ways to help improve safety in the home through decluttering an organization. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Stephen. Um, one interesting thing that you said that women are at a higher risk for the yeah. broken hip. Is there a particular reason for that? Um, osteoporosis for one. Um, and I think um, women tend to live longer. So there's just more women. Okay. In the population. Okay. Okay. I'm going to mute you unless anyone has any other questions for Steven and turn it over to Ed. All set? Okay, thank you. Steven, that was really good. Um, and it's absolutely staggering when you sit back and you hear the numbers about the, the rate of falls and then, and then the overall cost of falls. It's, it's really something that needs to be addressed. Um, so I'm Ed McCarthy. This is my partner and fiance, Claire Davids, and we are from Caring Transitions of Monmouth. And we have a very unique uh, take on this because really our, a lot of people think that our business is focused on just moving seniors, right? moving them from a home they may have spent between 20 and 50 years in and moving them into assisted living. But caring transitions is really about getting into, getting a senior, getting a client into a space that is 
more of their home. So it could be a daughter, a son, it could be their own home that's just been redesigned or made safer through a decluttering or a downsizing. So it doesn't always have to be somebody moving. We just want to make sure they get to that next phase of their life in the safest and most efficient way that they can. And as Stephen was talking, I could not help but think of a client that we've had over the last couple of weeks. Um, it's really your story because you got very close to, to these two women. But suffice to say, I'm going to tee up Claire to tell the story. There were two twins. Uh, they're 96 years old. And the number one thing that kept them apart was a fall. Is that right? That's right. They, um, one of the sisters fell and broke her hip. Um, a year ago and just the recovery from that at 95 was um, it took a year to recover she was in hospital for about nine months and then she was in assisted living um, for three months after that and they were separate the whole time and they have basically spent their entire lives together grew up together and the isolation um, that happened through COVID and them just being separate um, took an incredible toll on them and that was just because she fell freak accident she actually tripped um she, i think she, yeah, i don't know why she tripped but she tripped over something in the home and um and it kept her hospitalized um and isolated for a year the happy ending to that story is we actually got to move them into a new assisted living facility where they could share a bedroom um and they get to wake up every day now with each other in the same room so there was a good happy ending to that story but it was a long an arduous year for both of them and it really took a toll just from a simple fall over some something in the house that was cluttered yeah so i, I think a lot about them when we're talking about falls and, and safety and i think part of the reason that we both got into this business is we see a, a need um and it was reaffirmed there was a study that came out of ucla a few years ago and it looked at the impact of possessions uh, or as we we in the business call it stuff uh, you know, the impact of stuff on your ability to live a, a healthy, safe life. And it really showed that managing the volume of your possessions in your home, uh, yes, falling is part of that, but there are a lot of downsides. There are a lot of negative impacts of having too much stuff in your living space. Uh, among other things, it elevates the level of stress hormones in your body. Right? So if you're thinking about your physiological reaction to that, the more stress hormones you have, the more likely you're, you're going to be to have uh, maybe a little bit of a spare tire around the mouth. Not, I'm not a medical person, but this is my understanding. Um, <laughs> you know, the more stress, the more we want to eat, the more we start to pad that little tire around our middles. So it's, yes, it's falling, but just the idea of having so much stuff in your home can really have negative impact. And it's also an impact on memory. But yeah, it, it, the increase on stress hormones can really contribute to, manage, uh, to memory impairment. I mean, it's not dissimilar. So if, you, if you're stressing about all this stuff you have in your house, it really, it's not just the stuff that's such a problem as, as much as it can be also uh, memory issues. And for anybody who may be um, suffering or about to suffer or have early onset uh, dementia or anything like that, things like this can really speed up uh, that, that process. So it's really important to, um, to manage it, not just from a safety standpoint, but from a, a, a memory impairment standpoint and a hormonal standpoint, because everything just ends up being one big problem otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it, it also comes into play when you're looking at somebody who, who does want to move, whether it's in with a, an adult child or it's into one of these amazing facilities that we work with. And it goes something like this. You, you go to see, you know, I'll use an example. You go to see an, an atria or an artist or a, or a Seabrook and they're a magnificent places, beautiful. Like I, I would be very happy, you know, if my mom would decide to go to, into a place like that. And they go and they get this tour and they fall in love with a place and then they come back to their home. And just the thought of, it's, it's overwhelming in terms of where do I start, right? Where, where do I begin to, I, I, I love this new place, but I can't possibly take this on. We deal with a lot of older people mm -hmm. who have children who are out of state or they, or they don't have children or their nearest relative is in their 80s anyway. So think about the impact of that. You've seen this place that you want to move to, but 
the, the fatigue, the depression, the, the sadness, it, it just starts to really take over because there's this lack of a starting point. There, there's no place to go. So people start to feel trapped by their stuff. Is that fair to say? Yeah. yeah. And then that also just adding onto that, that triggers a, uh, like an inability to make any decisions. Um, yeah. And we deal with this a lot because people are thinking, okay, I have all this stuff. I have everything in my house and I need to, even I need to make it, um, I want to have in-home care. So I now need to make my house safe or make room for somebody to come in or maybe I need some mobility equipment in my house. And now I just can't think about it. I just can't make any decisions. And they, you get, you spiral into this inability to make decisions, which then in, increases the other side effects of fatigue and depression and anxiety and all of that stuff. It just becomes a big, well, I think the word spiral is really important because, yeah. again, I'll, I'll go to a, a client example. So um, two residents in a two-bedroom apartment, one on a wheelchair, uh, one in a walker, they need that extra bit of space. But you're talking about decision-making. Yeah. Do you want to talk about the, the clients that we had that had all of the mail from like the last 10 oh my years? Oh, goodness, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, they had literally 10 years worth of mail spread out. Yeah, right. spread out over one of the beds. One of them was sleeping in a recliner because they had the bed that was taken up because of all the mail. It was bank statements from 2007. It was junk mail from and flyers and stuff that had come through the door. Um, and they just, they were so overwhelmed. Uh, and, and because they were seniors, they didn't really understand digital and that they don't need to keep all their, all their statements and all the information that um, it just, it, I spent two days sitting with them, going through their mail, telling them, you don't need to keep this because of this. I'm like, you don't need to keep this because of this. And the entire thing was about safety, but they couldn't wrap their heads around how to make it safe because, it, and they weren't hoarders. It wasn't a hoarding situation. No, no. It was nothing to do with that. It was really just an inability to make a decision and have an understanding of what it was that they were dealing with. And I think it was stress. I think, you know, when I sat down and went through it, with, uh, with her, she, she, she had her full faculty, she understood, she knew exactly what she needed to get rid of, she needed somebody else to help her make that decision because she was so overwhelmed. Yeah, in, in a sense what we have to do a lot of times, we put people on what we call a diet, right, a stuff diet. Um, you know, just like we can get during quarantine or we can get around the holidays, your house can just get a little overweight. And you know, that's where the falls and the dust and everything else starts to come into play. So. From our perspective, um, you know, we can see long, term. We, we can take that long-term goal of staying in your home, but it has to be safer or staying with an adult child or moving into a new facility. And we can start to help clients just take that first step, right? It, it, it comes down to like, it's not gonna be gone in a day. It's not gonna be a one hour thing, but where do you start? Where did we start with that client with all the mail? Was it with the mail? It was with the mail. Yeah, it was with the mail. We just sat and we went through boxes of papers. Yeah, um, just kind of, and it was almost like it's like ripping off a bandaid. Um, once we started going through things, she, this lady who was so overwhelmed. Once we started, we made piles, right? Okay, so here's your pile of stuff you should probably keep because it's it's important. Here's the piles of stuff that you should shred because it has important information, and here's the piles of stuff we can just put in the trash. She actually took charge after after about a, it was a two day project, but after about two or three hours she took charge and she was actually I actually had to pull some things out of the out of the trash because I was like you probably want to keep that so it was almost like her endorphins kicked in and she thought I can do this I can you know there's actually I see a way out now and she um she really went 360 one is it 180 180 she went, really went 180 <laughs> um and she 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 took ownership of it. She was so proud at the end as we were dragging sacks of big black sacks of paper. She was, she wasn't dragging them. Um, she was so proud of the fact that she had accomplished that and she had done it. It was really, it's, it's kind of, you know, none of this is, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not supposed to be self gratifying, as you, you know, but, but it is. I mean, everybody was so proud of what we had accomplished at the end of the day because all of a sudden she didn't have to sleep in her recliner that night. She could sleep on the bed. Yeah. Um, so, and that you go back, just going back a step to what we were talking about, 
you talk about you know the increase in stress and and the impact that that has um and the, the fatigue and the depression it was almost like a weight had lifted when she saw when she saw what had happened yeah and i, th I think that the outcome of that was once she started to say okay i you know i got rid of all this mail i got rid of all these things that were on my bed I don't need that dresser anymore either. And yeah. I can leave the armoire and I can. So she really started to get into it. And like you said, the momentum really took her a long way it really did, and yeah. ended up leaving a lot of stuff behind. So I guess the only other thing that we can share before we turn things over to Lynn would be, um, and I think it goes back to this conversation, is, is start small, right? Yeah. If you think about uh, decluttering a home and making it safer, like, with this client, um, she couldn't bear the idea of just going through all that mail. But if you set small goals, right? The long-term goal is to be where you wanna be and be safe in that space. But maybe the short-term goal is just getting all of the bank statements gone. It, maybe it's just cleaning out a closet. Maybe, um, uh, what else am I, am I missing? They would know it starts small, which would mean, yeah, just start with the closet, start with uh, one chest of drawers, start with whatever it is. Um, but the other thing we would always say as well is get help, right? right. Bring, get a coach. Bring, bring a coach, bring, a, bring, bring somebody in, whether it's a family member, whether it's somebody, you know, whether it's a paid service like us, it doesn't, you know, whoever it is, people can't make those decisions alone or sometimes they look for validation, especially seniors. So, um, you know, all, we always suggest them to, get help, get, get somebody who's in your, on your side and in your court who can help you make those decisions. And sometimes somebody who is impartial and doesn't have the emotional attachment to those things can help you to start to make those decisions. I think that's a really yeah. important. The, the, at the end of the day, somebody who understands and knows you enough to say, you're going to need this and maybe you want this, but everything else we can figure out a way for it to, to be out of the way and, and make your home safe. And present other options as well, right? So if you have if you have a ton of pictures, well, let's find a way. Maybe you know there's there's services out there that you can use that can digitize all your pictures. So you know what you have this big box of pictures and you really love them and you really want them and, and you really should keep them because it's memories and you can't you know you can't replace those types of things. So let's find a way to digitize them and let's show you how you can look at them. Um, and then you don't need to keep the physical pictures anymore. You know, so things like that as well presenting options to create space. One of those LED picture displays. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that we got from my mom and she couldn't figure out how to yeah, use it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, because we also, we wanna make sure that uh, people understand it. it is tough, right? We're not just gonna walk in. You can't just walk into someone's house and say, okay, you gotta get rid of all this stuff. Back up the dumpster. Yeah, yeah. That, that doesn't work. But so you have to help make sure that it, they know it's okay if they're feeling overwhelmed, if they're feeling sad, if they're feeling guilty, all of those things that, all those feelings that you have, it's almost like a grief process. So we have to kind of, you know, help people know that it's okay to not want to do it, to feel overwhelmed, um, but to understand that the safety aspects of keeping too much stuff in your house um oh they surpass the need for keeping the stuff yeah absolutely safety uh over everything else yeah we say that we say that all the time to our customers our primary focus is your safety so we're we're empathetic we're compassionate we do understand everything that you're going through and we do we've all i mean we've all had to at some point in our lives downsize so, or, or or you know get rid of stuff so we understand maybe not to the extent that you have if you haven't had 50 years worth of it in your house but we do understand that you have to be safe and we you know we i think that's probably the thing we say the most to people safety first so yeah. as empathetic as we're going to be we're going to put your safety first i think i said that like 12 times now so i'll stop <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying is safety first. yeah i think that's what i might have mentioned yes yeah. <laughs> And I think that's probably a really good yeah. segue. That's probably a very good segue. Handing over to Lynn. Yeah, yeah well, th there is a question. Okay. Speaking of safety, what are some of the biggest safety issues you see going into particularly senior homes? And what are the top recommendations you give to help remediate some of those issues? I, th I think the number one is the volume of possessions. Um, and, and in particular, you see a lot of, and stop me if I'm wrong here, but I think there's a huge 
difficult. It's so difficult for seniors to get rid of almost anything. They, they attach memories and emotions, as we all do. It's not just seniors, to dining room tables where we had Thanksgiving for 30 years in a row or, you know, my, my granddaughter's uh, communion dress. Like, nobody wants to get rid of that. So you don't even recognize it when you're in your own home, but if you stop and you take a look around, it's like, wow, like you just start to realize there's so many things. And I think when we go in, if we know that like one uh, client who's in a wheelchair, if there are starting, to, if you're starting to see those areas where you cannot possibly get a wheelchair out of there and heaven forbid there's a fire, right? It's that, that idea of clear passage right, for a wheelchair or a walker or just anybody walking through there, if you're starting to see, and everybody's home has like pathways, the, the, the trodden paths that people walk, if you're starting to see infringement into those areas, that's a huge red flag. Absolutely. And then you open the closet and, you know, just close To be closet. fair, I'm guilty of that. that yeah. <laughs> The junk drawer, but well, you know, it's when the junk drawer turns into every single closet and every single drawer. That's the or a garage, a garage or attics are dead giveaways, right? If you go into a garage and it's just stacked high to the ceiling, that's that's a red flag. Mm -hmm. uh, attics uh, where you've got boxes, you don't even know what are in the boxes. Anytime you go into a basement and there's any type of box buildup. Uh, there could be mold, insects, there could be all kinds of stuff in there. So you really have to look at some of the... Oh, my Lord, we have one house that had a collection of dolls in it in the attic and a raccoon had gone in there and made a nest in there um, and um, ripped up all the packaging that was around the dolls. So, I mean, that's, and that's a safety issue right now because now you've got a pest fire in hazard. your house. You've yeah. got a fire hazard because of all the ripped up um, items. So it's not a full necessarily a full um, issue because the um, it was in the attic and no one goes in there but from a safety perspective that was yeah that was not nice no. um, yeah I hope that answered the question yeah thank you all right okay Lynn you are unmuted um, I'm Lynn I'm a physical therapist for uh, Amir 32 years now, and uh, my passion has been to prevent falls because as everybody was saying, Stephen and Claire and Ed, that falls really lead to a lot of medical, social, emotional issues, and let alone the pandemic, you can't be in a situation that might potentially isolate you further. So I became quite passionate about falls uh, over the years because I kept giving the same talk every time I went in for physical therapy into a person's home where I saw the same hazards again and again and again and given the same talks again. And I said, you know, I really need to do something about this instead of talking about how nice it would be just to have a methodical way to help people with falls. This was before I met Caring Transitions. Now this is a great area where I can just say, hey, call Claire and Ed, they can help you remove some of the hazards. Um, a lot of the things that I see these days is uh, relating to age is the fact that everybody knows that as you get older, you might shrink, you might lose height, you have, you know, grandma say, well, honey, I used to be, you know, five feet. And now you're looking at her saying, man, I don't even think she's four, eight, you know, because she's shrunk and she's hunched over and she can't pick up her head. Now, that's true that a lot of people do that when they age. What is the problem with that? Well, the closer we go towards the ground, the more gravity is going to be pushing down on you and you're getting closer to the floor logistically and you're at higher risk to fall because your center of balance is off. So posture we see as a huge problem as a predisposition to falls in the aging. Uh, the other thing, as Stephen said, osteoporosis of course wears down the joints, makes them more prone for fractures. But in looking at people's homes, one of the three top things three top areas of risk for fall are 
as uh, Claire and Ed mentioned, uh, clutter. The clutter that's everywhere is a huge risk for falls. Loose rugs. If you ever walk into anybody's homes and you see these little rugs that are cute around the toilet, the welcome mats, and you these uh, throw rugs, these area rugs that have these corners that every time they go over it, it rolls up on itself. It presents a huge tripping hazard. You see them in almost every house when you go into over a certain age. And the other thing is uneven surfaces, whether it be a step or whether it be the fact that there was a loose tile, there was a loose carpet, something that made the surface uneven. People, as they're hunched over and they're walking, can't pick up their feet as much. So those little uneven surfaces cause them to trip and fall. So top three answers on the board, as I used to say, if this was a family feud, would be loose rugs, uneven surfaces, and clutter as far as falls. Because these are things that, and I'm guilty, and I think if I asked everybody here who has some form of clutter, I think that most people would at least be guilty of one of these problems in their homes, and I could probably raise two hands, but we'll go past this. The other problem that puts the elderly and others at risk for fall is as they get older, they've been given a walker, a cane, some cases a wheelchair. They think that it makes them look old. So they don't use it. Or they say to me, I, you know, I have a walker, I don't really need it. Let me show you how I walk. And you see them and they're tottering back and forth or they're leaning forward and they're grabbing onto this piece of furniture and this piece, they're grabbing onto the wall, they're lurching towards the counter. But no, they don't need the walker, right? Because they have all this furniture around until that one day that that piece of furniture got moved or that slid across the rug or the corner of the rug. Now, they don't have that handheld that they used to do. That walker isn't there and down they go. So when people are not using the devices that they were assigned, given, recommended, that's another huge problem that makes a lot of people fall. And I tell them, listen, your muscles in your body are designed to work a certain way. They align your body in a certain way. That way means that you don't have to work as hard because your body is more efficient. Anytime you take your body off that optimum alignment, you're putting some muscles shortened and some muscles overstretched. What does that do? It makes neither group of muscles efficient. So therefore it puts you, makes you work harder. So that's one of the first things I'll tell them is let's use whatever device what, that we need to do to get you in a best position so you don't have to work as hard. They like that idea. Sometimes it's a little harder to convince. But the other problem that I tell them is, okay, well, I'm sure you're very safe in your home, but what happens when your sister comes in? Didn't you tell me your sister had a stroke and she... What if the home isn't as safe when your sister comes over and she falls? How would you feel? That's kind of like an edge that I have sometimes when they think the environment is safe enough for them and they have no problems. I say, but what if your grandchild comes over? Oh, what's going to happen? That, that loose tile or that loose carpet, something's going to fall underneath. They're going to get stuck. It, again, takes the responsibility off them uh, as far as it's not it's not something I'm doing wrong. I'm just making it safer for everybody else Sometimes that allows them to change a little bit more But as a uh, caring transition said you can't nobody's going to change their home in one day I've given a lot of recommendations and some people are faster than others But nobody's going to do it all in one day and if you tried to do it in one day you would make the person feel very vulnerable and like you said, sad or depressed or confused because things are not the way that they were in their home. So you have to think of it methodically. You have to be aware of what rooms are, what objects are in what rooms. That's why 
when it said, uh, when Vicki said, I'm the author of Don't Fall, I created a book called Don't Fall. And what is it? It's a workbook that allows you to safely, easily, and methodically move through every room of your house, starting in the driveway, including basements. I didn't include attics, although that may be on a further addition, I ought to add a section on attics. But you have to be aware of what's in each room so that you can attack it methodically so that if the living room is somebody's favorite room, you would probably want to start in the living room and make that as safe as possible for them to go there. And then that bathroom is the closest. Well, then you want to make the bathroom. You want to start, you got to start somewhere. You can't change everything. So I'd like to think that by creating an individualized safety plan for people, that they can stay in the environment that they're in more safely, have people that come over to help them, as in assisting hands, have anybody that comes in, they're safer, which means they can better care for the clients, which allows them to age more gracefully and safely without as much stress in their lives. And I think that's the key of fall prevention, is what I said is, if you have less stress on your body, if you have less stress in your life, by, by altering your environment little by little and making it safer, you're going to live longer, you're gonna have more quality, because without falls, you can just live and move around and do what you want to do in your home because you have the safe space to move. You have the aid or you have the nurse coming in. You've gotten rid of the clutter. And that's why it's so great to work with teamwork at, in uh, situations like this because there's no one person that can help everybody prevent falls. It really is a team effort involving the client, involving their family, their friends, their doctors. We all have to work together because we have a common goal, right? We want people to be safe. So I always say, if anybody ever has any concerns about falls, uh, about their environment and how to make it safer, don't fall and give me a call. I'm Lynn Knight. And I just hope that everybody doesn't fall. I have tons of stories, but everybody, they gave such wonderful stories. I'll just do one. And my grandmother, who uh, was getting into her 90s, and she didn't fall, but I said to her, Grandma, I said, didn't they give you a walker recently because you were feeling weak? She says, yeah, but... I don't want to use that, she said. It makes me look old. Mind you, at the time, she was about 92. And I said, all right, Grandma. She said, no, no, Lynn, it would be just embarrassing. And I said, okay, Grandma, what's more embarrassing? Using a walker, being able to go down the street, go see your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, you know, walk with the dog, get out, enjoy things or falling on your face and having to call 911 and have them help you get up and your face is all scraped up and you're hurt and God forbid you break a hip. So you tell me, what's more embarrassing? And she goes, ah, okay, I get your point. And I'd like to say the truth, which is the next time that I went to see her, she told me she took my advice and that she continued to use her walker. So I can't convince everybody, but I am passionate about falls, so if anybody ever wants to talk about fall preventions, that's what I love to do. Now, Lynn, what would your top tip be for someone to prevent a fall? I have three main, I, I guess three, and that is, uh, and it encompasses a lot of the things that were said today, eating healthy. That means, you know, you're not just eating the sugars, you're not, you, you know, you're watching your diets. I'm not saying go on a diet. I'm saying eating healthy food because that nourishes your body. It gives you the protein that your muscles need. The other thing is moving around, uh, simple exercises, pumping your ankles up and down, moving your arms, moving your legs, moving around frequently. Not, I say to people, you don't have to exercise for an hour a day. Do little bursts of activity during the day. And the last thing I like to call is brain food. 
what's brain food? For some people, it's doing puzzles. For some people, it's, you know, reading. For mm -hmm. some people, it's socializing. But your brain needs as much food as your body does because there's been studies again and again, if you're just sitting around, not engaging with other people, your brain goes to mush too, just like your muscles do. So the top three things that I like to tell people to do that, besides of course, the clearing of the clutter and cleaning out the hazards, is eating healthy, which includes appropriate hydration, like Stephen mentioned, moving around in frequent small bursts of activity and brain food. Okay, I see Ed's got his hands raised. So unmute yourself, Ed. I had my hand raised because Claire told me to raise it. <laughs> <laughs> and he always, and he always <laughs> does what he's told. <laughs> um, well, I just wanted one of the things I wanted to capitalize on something that that Lynn said, um, which is like being methodical when you go through the rooms and you're methodical about, you know, working each room. So one of the things that we do, and it has been so helpful, it did nearly cause me to throw my computer out the window a couple of times, but now I've got to grips with it. It's, um, is we actually can do some space planning um, for people. So we actually have some software and it has medical devices in it. So it, it you know, and so we can take measurements of the rooms and take measurements of the, um, of the furniture and plot them out in the room and we can say okay this is what your room looks like yeah. here's where a, a wheelchair might go I really did. I just wanted to know when I can come and see you um, what? Did I hear? <laughs> I muted her. Okay. Um, and then, and sort of like, and so we, and we can actually help them. And sometimes with people, it really helps when they can visualize that. So when you're being methodical, we can actually print out and we can print it out as big as they want. And we can show them that look, with your dresser and your bureau and your wheelchair and your walker and your bed and this and that and the other, it just doesn't work. So um, it's methodical. It's another way of being methodical, but and we can take it with them room by room. And it was just when you said that, Lynn, it made me think of, you know, that's something else because it helps people to connect the dots in their mind. Uh, well, that's really going to be unsafe because if I have the TV here and I can't get the walker through, then how am I going to get through without my walker? And then I might fall down. And then um, it's sometimes it's, it, it was just, I felt it was worth noting. That's perfect. I mean, I think that's great that you can, that you can do that. And you say you don't have to get rid of this thing that you've had for years and you have so much attachment, but, but, according to this plan, it would fit nicely in this room. Yeah. So it wouldn't interfere. That's, that's fantastic. Can I ask you a question, Lynn? Sure. I'm raising my hand for me this time. Should <laughs> <Yes. laughs> I allow you? <laughs> so your book is great. I, I actually, you, uh, first time we met, you actually, uh, I, I bought one. And I think it's great because it feels like you're putting the power into the hands of the, the homeowner, into, into the senior. Do you see that? Because it's an actual workbook. It's, it's right. really cool. Well, that, that's why I designed it that way that, you know, if, if a question such as do you, can you get into your bathroom? Yes or no? Yes, no problem. Uh, no, that's a problem. You got to put it on the problem list. So I did that specifically because I ran into some agencies that were saying that they, you know, really were good about telling people where the hazards were. But if you don't have a list right in front of them, I said this way, okay, Uncle Bob comes over. And what does Uncle Bob say? Let me see the list. Okay, I'm going to check off one thing today. And then the son comes in and says, okay, let me look at the list. I'm going to attack one thing a day. So little by little, like we said, methodically, you check off each other and attack them and make it a nice, smooth, easy transition and everybody has input. But like you said, they're responsible and they're accountable for, yes, we did mention all the safety hazards to you. We didn't just mention them to, here's a list of them. So like you said, it's in, it's in their face so that they're, again, if you're not aware of where the safety hazards are, how can you fix them? 
And it also gives them an element of, I was really going to speak, but I saw you on mute, so I took it. It also gives them an element of control in their own destiny, right? Because now they're, they're on their own time. I mean, obviously there's a sense of urgency, but they're on their own time schedule. They can check the things off the list as they, as they choose to do it. And I think given that empowerment is probably really helpful as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Sorry, what were you going to say? Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yeah, we can open the floor up now to everybody. If anybody has a question, you know, raise your hand or unmute yourself and feel free to ask anything of Lynn, Ed and Claire or Steven. I see Eric commented, that is a really great idea. Which was a great idea, Eric? I'll just say it, making the list and kind of saying, hey, look, we told you about this risk and just so it's kind of a checklist and then they've got to deal with it. It's documented that it's been brought to their attention. So. Right. <clears throat> and I have to say, I, I have a, um, I have a client that uses uh, the aids through assisting hands and, you know, I've, I've heard nothing but good things and that they're very caring people. And I've introduced caring transitions. I've been to some of their sales and I see how nicely they do it as far as, you know, the, the people's possessions presenting them in a, in a caring way to allow, giving them options on how they can get rid of it if they don't want to keep it. And I just, I love the fact that we can all work together to accomplish the same goal, to keep our seniors safe. Yeah, we love our we love Thank our you. seniors and we want to keep them happy and at home as long as possible. So, okay, well, if anybody doesn't have any questions, we can wrap it up today.